So Badlands was Terrence Malick's debut. It premiered in 1973 at the New York Film Festival as the closing film. In the U.S., you can get it on Criterion Blu-ray. You can also see it on iTunes or Filmstruck. In the U.K., it has a Blu-ray release from Warner Brothers and is also on iTunes. It was regarded as one of the defining films of its decade. It has a 98% on Rotten Tomatoes and a 76% on Metacritic. And this is kind of interesting because it's in 73. So it's like the heart of the new Hollywood movement, but this feels so different from just about every other new Hollywood film. It's remarkably prescient. Um, Despite being a film released in the 70s, it, it still feels very aware of the violence that's inherent to American philosophy and American nationalism. It has a lot of the same isolation that the writer has. Uh, I mean, it's set uh, titularly in the Badlands. And I think a big part of what identifies its violence and its enabling of that violence is the expanse of the area in which it takes place. And I think one of the important things is when you look at the new Hollywood movement, which is, you know, this uprising of like the first film school generation of directors in the late 60s and early 70s and even into the 80s you know you see a dramatic change right around 1973 in the tone and obviously you can't disassociate that from vietnam but you go from films like two lane blacktop and the last picture show and the french connection and even stuff like american graffiti and then you go in 1973 you have badlands and Mean Streets, and Serpico, and The Exorcist. 74, you have the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which I think very similarly... And Chinatown. ...peels apart that the dirty underlayer of American culture and society. And, you know, it, it really... You kind of look at that, this is like a defining film in changing how Americans viewed America, which obviously would continue. You know, you have... The next year, you have Mel Brooks with Blazing Saddles, which is a very pointy critique of <laughs> our kind of image. But, you know, you also have stuff like In the Midst of Watergate, All the Presidents and Men coming out. And then you have, you know, films like Taxi Driver, which are just these brutally dark looks at the reality of what America's cities are like. And this is kind of the opposite of that. This is as much as the grime and grit of Taxi Driver shows the underbelly of Manhattan. This is, again, showing the forgotten people in the Midwest, and it's showing the danger of how sparse things are. So it's a semi-fictionalization of a murder spree committed by Charles Starkweather and an underage girlfriend, Carol Ann Fugate. Uh, That was in 1958. The film starts with Martin Sheen playing Kit, where he meets uh, 15-year-old Holly, played by Sissy Spacek, uh, in this small town in South Dakota. She's a young teenage girl living with her father, and he is a garbage collector who quickly loses his job, and they fall into a very toxic romance, not the least of which is defined by the 10-year age difference between the 25-year-old Kit and 15-year-old Holly. They elope, and by elope we mean he kills her father and runs away with her. And the following crime spree that they go on, and murder spree, definitely peels apart some of the American dream and the geography that enables it. And... You know, I'm not sure if it's even the age difference that's the biggest factor in what's off about their relationship. Oh, yeah, definitely Kit is dealing with some violent and antisocial characteristics. I also think he's just a psychopath. He, he plays her really well, and she is infatuated with him. You know, it constantly brings up that he resembles James Dean. Yeah. And, you know, this is kind of a critique of that whole you know, greaser generation of the violence that was associated in the portrayals of the greaser generation. And it's a look at what that actually was. Yeah, I mean, it's funny that you brought up Blazing Saddles because, I mean, much like uh, Rebel Without a Cause, you know, Blazing Saddles kind of took apart some of the racial tensions in Hollywood that, I mean, we still deal with to this day. And, And likewise, I mean, James Dean represents this kind of, I mean, rebel... But James Dean represents this kind of Hollywood ideal of the bad boy. Also, just a, a, an image of masculinity that can get away with anything. Right. So they basically, they travel along 
the Midwest and they very rarely come across people. I mean, for a little while they hide in like this woodlands uh, until bounty hunters catch up with them. They continue traveling and basically every time they meet someone in this, in a very isolated space, Kit ends up killing that person. Yeah. And then they continue running. Except he doesn't kill. They, they come across a rich family and they rob them and they take his Cadillac and everything and they take a bunch of supplies, but they don't kill him. That's true. That is the one family they... And that kind of sticks out. I, I think it is important to note that Malik actually removed some of the most horrific crimes that... Oh, in real life, he killed that family. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he killed that family. I think he also... He, he killed Holly, which is obviously the names have been changed. He killed her baby sister, like an, in, right. like an infant. He killed a pet dog. He killed family friends. I think, I don't know if it's necessarily to the film's credit that it cut out some of those most horrific moments because I, I wonder if that would have done a better picture or would have painted a better picture of... This is not a direct adaptation. It's inspired yeah. by. Yeah. You know, that, that would be like... That's true. You know, <sighs> this is telling its own story. I just wonder if that would have actually even better painted sort of the unhealthy power dynamic behind some of the infatuation that Holly might have had for Kit. Mm -hmm. And I think Holly really represents how attracted to, like, this violent rebel archetype Americans were. Mm -hmm. And then once she sees the darkness of that, she gets scared. Yeah, it, I mean, it's it's interesting that she even goes along with for it as long as she does, because at a certain point in the film, she says, like, I'd never seen Kit this violent before. I'm like, oh, you know, he shot your dad in the stomach. That was like one of the first things y'all did together. Yeah. Or not even together. I mean, that's one of the first things that he did in your presence. Definitely, I mean, certainly I don't blame her necessarily for... Which I really think that's, you know, this is what, like two years after the Pentagon Papers come out. You know, I really think this is a film about Vietnam and kind of Americans coming to terms with the American experience in Vietnam. Yeah, it's, it's kind of implied that he might have military experience. Um, certainly the way he acts in the initial... And I'm not even talking that directly, though. Like, yeah, he def it definitely right, not... implies that, you know, he was probably served in Korea or something. Right, but... But I'm talking just, like, more generally, America's America has worshipped throughout the 40s and 50s and all these Westerns, these very violent archetypes. Yeah, I mean, the initial time that they're in that woodland area, he... He and she are living like this almost Swiss Family Robinson yes. uh, esque life, where they have a treehouse, and he runs around doing like, military ex uh, exercises, where he they plan, they pretend to like you know, you know, what would we do if we were caught by people? Uh, and he sets up forest traps, and he runs around with a gun, you know, much like a soldier in a movie would. And I think that's that's kind of where that infatuation is most immediately visible before any of the real horror sets in for Holly. Yeah. Um, is that, that sensation that we're, we're just two kids out in the woods playing soldiers. It's interesting you say two kids. Cause I think that's also like, he's obviously incredibly manipulative, mm -hmm. but one of the reasons I say, I don't think the age difference bothered me that much is he's very clearly someone who is not, is a misfit and isn't mature enough to handle life. Now, he turns to this brutal violence, but I think that's an interesting dynamic, that they're both misfits seeking kind of their role and their meaning, and he just gives up. Certainly, he has a degree of, of arrested development where he he behaves, I mean, not unlike the, the teenage hooligans in Ratcatcher, mm -hmm. uh, with that same kind of aimless violence. But I do think part of Holly's attraction to him is the fact that i mean at least physically if not you know uh developmentally he's older than she is and so he has that kind of masculine authority that she would be attracted to and look at her father you know th right there's not her father's a painter on the other hand yeah and it's not only that like he's clearly not a very good parental figure right like he he shoots her dog for 
but like disobeying him. Yeah, because she's yeah. talking with Kit after he tells her not to. Yeah, he he straight up shoots her dog, which you know that burns him to her. Right. Well, and and I think it's interesting. I mean, that violence is his response too. I mean, even as a painter, his his way of parenting is rather than actually providing any kind of logical parental advice or or comfort or alternative. You know, don't do this thing. If you do this thing, I will violently respond by removing other things that you love. And it's also just, it, it's kind of like this statement about how unfair life is because the dog suffers. Right. Because of someone else's choices. And that's kind of a theme that's throughout this film. You know, someone else's choices causing suffering. This sort of movie, in other directors' hands, you could easily see the gore and the violence getting the front billing. Oh, and that's one thing that's interesting is this never goes there. This is not a graphic movie. The violence is very, very matter of fact, and you know, comes and goes. Um, not, not a few of the killings even happen just off screen. Yeah, uh, it's very classical Hollywood in that respect. I think very intentionally too. It, it, it doesn't want to make the violence glorified. The reason you see the yeah. movie, yeah. Um, not that I think the aestheticization of violence is inherently bad, but it, it very purposefully avoids giving viewers that excuse. And I think one interesting thing is while we're talking about, you know, these classical Hollywood symbols, it very much portrays Kit in the way that you would expect a hero to be portrayed. Mm -hmm. Because we have to remember that we are looking at this through Holly's eyes. So, you know, how, how things are set up in the beginning of the film, he is your classic Hollywood leading man. And then everything flips on its head. I mean, Holly being the narrator of the film, it is flipped on its head, but within the universe, within the film's, you know, universe, it's not. I mean, towards the end, once once Kit and Holly are inevitably caught, and in fact, actually, Holly finally is able to tell Kit that she doesn't want to keep going with him, and, and she, uh, I don't know if she turns herself in. Yeah, she turns herself in, um, and Kit continues on his way, but it's not long after he's caught. But one, once they are caught, a uh, kid is treated like a little bit of a a, a, hero. a local celebrity yeah. almost. Yeah. And I think one of the interesting things in the film at the end, since we got there, is, you know, he, he kind of revises his own narrative. And because Holly says in her voiceover, and we'll talk about the voiceovers for a little bit. You know, oh, he he said he got a flat tire. But then at the same time, we're seeing him get out of the car and shoot his tire. Right. So I think there's a certain point that either he gave up or he chose to get caught. Well, I, I think, and that's why I tend to lean more towards the horrible, manipulative, over, doesn't know what he's doing kind of narrative, uh, is the fact that he, I think he is aware at this point. Like, he sees himself in the newspaper. He likes to read about himself in the newspaper. The, the Oh, yeah. It makes a point of saying. He's aware that he's got that celebrity status. It's actually almost, it's almost even uh, prophetic of the discussion we've had to have over the countless uh, mass shootings where now in the media we have to decide how much do we want to show of a perpetrator's face if do are we giving them you know a, a post-mortem glorification that that they're kind of seeking this is very much around that time where we're coming to the realization that the way that we portray people in the media has a sort of self-feeding effect also one thing that's very prescient is the kind of very early critique of the relationship between America and their firearms. You know, even mm. after he's caught and he's this mass murderer, he's chatting it up with these marshals about what kind of weapon they're carrying. And, right. you know, it's very, there's a camaraderie there. And I think that's an interesting pointy critique for Malik. He's, he's throwing them like his lighter or a comb, knowing that it'll be an expensive souvenir that they can show off. Uh, there's certainly a feeling that... Uh, it's really just about the direction the gun was pointing is all that really differs between these men and Kit. You know, Americans would view police officers as heroes, but at the same time, there's this sensation that it's just a question of which way the gun was pointing. And that's one of the most interesting things, because in the film, they absolutely do act as heroes. But we're also rooting for the anti-hero because we see where they've come. Right, and and we have this moment of interaction between the hero and the anti-hero. Incredibly violent. It's a cyclical violence. Very gross that it's all taken at such a face value. And yet we also know it's kind of inherent to how we view our media and our Westerns and our American culture and history. I think one thing that just, I can't emphasize enough, you know, Malik is known for this incredibly lyrical content. 
And his narratives are always really interesting. The voiceover in this film is very unique because it forces a first person, which is something very difficult to manage in film, Mm -hmm. through the lens of Holly's experience. But it also establishes the wilderness that they're surrounded by as its own character. Right. Well, I I think very similarly to the writer, like the expansiveness and the desolation of the, the geography is its own actor in the game. Yes. Uh, And its own, its own force. I mean, literal force of nature, I suppose that is dictating some of the conditions and the behaviors of these people. A, A big part of why I think the, they were able to stay on the run for song is the fact that there's nobody out here, <laughs> but it turns against them. You know, right. I, so many of the key plot points are we're running out of gas. Right. You know, Honestly, it's we're, kind of amazing that they get as far as they do. The expanse is as much an enemy of theirs as it is their friend. And it turns on them in the end right? because they can't outrun him, which is itself a very apt and beautiful, I think, metaphor for the reality of, violence for america you know how much of this is in our dna how long can we keep using it and running running with it and from it before it eventually turns on us i mean certainly i would argue that there was never a point where it didn't wasn't turning on us already but it seems like those chickens are certainly coming to roost now more than ever 